students. Hey guys, what's up? How's it? The sky. I somehow I did not. I didn't see that coming. I'm. That's on me. That's on me. How are you guys doing? Everyone doing good? Yeah. How was last week? Good. Everyone silent, discoed out. Who's ready for another one next week? Me. We're not going to do that though. We're not going to do that. Hey, we we are kicking off a brand new series. Aaron told you a little bit about it earlier. Who, who remembers what it was about? That's the the name of it. Anyone besides the, the, the youngest yet most attentive group in the room, anyone else know what we're talking about today? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We have the youngest uh, that got us going, and then we have the smartest that have it going. So uh, we're, we're covered all of our bases. But hey, yeah, so we're going to be uh, talking about forgiveness. And maybe you're wondering why. Like, why, why does it matter? Why, why should we be talking about it? Here's the reason. I'm going to be very uh, just... Um, clear and precise and simple. Uh, You are in a situation. You have been in a situation. You will be in a situation where you either need to extend forgiveness or you need to receive forgiveness. So it is in our benefit to to see what God says about it. And so we're, we're getting ready for uh, Christmas time and, uh, you know, Halloween just passed and uh, our, our society has just skipped Thanksgiving for the most part. It's, it's Christmas time. In, in my house, Christmas time usually starts about the middle of July. Not sure about you guys. It ends about mid-April. So there's a small like two or three month window where Christmas doesn't exist. But other than that, probably mid-July, uh, Christmas music is playing in the house. That, that's how long it takes us to get ready for it because uh, my wife specifically is so excited about what we've been watching Christmas movies. And one Christmas movie in particular uh, tells one of the greatest stories of of unforgiveness, someone who was not willing to forgive ever. And that movie is The Grinch. The Grinch, specifically the Jim Carrey version because that's personally to me the best one. I don't think you can beat Jim Carrey's uh, The Grinch. He's just large. He's oddly shaped. Uh, He makes all the faces. He makes all the right noises. He is just perfect in that role, in that movie. Everything is great. And if you remember the story of The Grinch, uh, he uh, wound up in Whoville, right? And he was with all the other kids. He grew up in uh, an orphanage and he was in school and Christmas was coming around and he was getting excited about Christmas. He was making gifts. He was making weird paper mache Christmas decorations. Uh, he was getting ready for Christmas. He was excited about Christmas and he goes to school the next day and he begins to get made fun of and ridiculed. And that sets him on a path that changes his life forever. He held so much resentment and so much unforgiveness over that moment that he separated himself from the entire town. He literally lived up on top of a mountain and he would spend his days reminding himself of how bad everyone else was and all that they did for him. And he just lived in a constant state of unforgiveness. Here's the reason I bring it up. Sometimes we can get in a situation much like the Grinch, where it feels better to just live in those feelings of resentment, to live in those feelings of bitterness than to actually deal with them, right? Like we want to feel justified for our feelings. We want to feel justified for our anger. We want to still feel justified because of what they did to us was so wrong, And so sometimes it's actually easier and it feels more right. We're using the term bittersweet. There's a a sweetness to staying bitter because it means that you're validating what happened to you. It means that you're not just simply uh, forgetting about it. It means that you're you're acknowledging it. And there's some some benefits there. There's some, some real truth there about acknowledging it, like acknowledging that things happen. But what we're gonna learn today is going to be uh, ch- hopefully we'll change our mind about it because we don't want to stay bittersweet. We don't want to stay bittersweet at the, the friend group that shut us out. We don't want to say bittersweet at uh, the people that talked bad about us, that spread lies about us. We don't want to stay bittersweet at the people who treated us badly, who bullied us, who made fun of us. What, whatever it is, what we're going to find out is that staying that way is not in our benefit. And because, like I said, our, our solutions, if it was just up to us, we would stay there. 
We would just stay in that state of annoyance. We would stay in that state of resentment. We would stay in that state of, of bitterness. And, and here's how we're gonna define bitterness for uh, not only tonight, but for the rest of this series. Bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. Has anyone ever felt bitter before? Angry or disappointed at unfair treatment? You can raise your hand if you've ever felt bigger, better before. Angry are disappointed at being treated unfairly. You can put your hands down and the lights down. Um, but uh, when it comes to the pain that we have uh, experienced, listen, hey, lean in real quick. When it comes to this pain that we have experienced, that pain is never gonna happen apart from people. That pain is never going to happen apart from people. There will always be people involved in the pain in our life. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen uh, in a wayward moment. The pain that we experience, the pain that happens in our life will always happen with people. The pain that, will always, that happens in our life will always happen with people. And so one of the main figures, we're gonna do what we always do. This is my goal here. This is what I want for us is that we will dig into the Bible and begin to ask and seek, what does God say about this? Begin to ask and see, what should we do? Begin to ask and seek, how should we operate based on what God says? So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna be looking at uh, the Apostle Paul. We've talked about him before. You probably know him from his uh, many uh, great writings. Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. You probably know him from uh, many of the great theological truths come straight from Paul. But what you might not know him as someone who spent most of his life being mistreated, uh, simply for trying to tell people about Jesus. He was sent to jail for trying to tell people about Jesus. He was beat for trying to tell people about Jesus. He was uh, uh, stoned, like people literally threw baseball-sized rocks as hard as they uh, could at him. So I don't think they were pitching at the speed of the, the Braves pitchers that help us win the World Series, but they were throwing rocks fairly fast and fairly hard to inflict pain. And this was his experience with the people around him. And so I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes. If you were trying to help people, if you were trying to serve people, if you were trying to do these things, and yet they put you in jail, and yet they hurt you, and yet they mistreated you and lied about you, what would you do? I think our natural response is, is simply to be angry. I think our natural response is to maybe want to get revenge right? Like someone does something to us, someone says something to us, someone uh, hurts us, what do we do? I think our natural uh, response is to try and get them back. So anyone have any different solution? I think our natural response is to uh, try and get them back, like, right? Well, hey, if you do this to me, I'm going to do this back to you. And that's the uh, kind of like our culture, right? Eye for an eye, Tooth for a tooth, that was the culture at that time. In our time, we talk about, uh, you know, cancel culture. Someone, someone does something to me. Someone does something bad. It goes against what I believe in. It goes what been, against what I would do. Well, we just, we just cancel them, right? They're done. They're gone. It's over. That is the, the reality and the culture that we're living in, that that is what happens when people disagree. That is what happens when uh, it, things get hard. That is what happens uh, when we get feel mistreated, when we feel wronged. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna dive in and see what the Apostle Paul is going to say to other believers who are experiencing the same thing. So uh, join me, there's some Bibles in your seats. I would love for you to join in and read with me. We're gonna be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. It says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brother, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. We urge you, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, 
and be patient with them all. So Paul is encouraging a standard of behavior. Paul is encouraging a way that he thinks people should act regardless of their situation, to to love people well, regardless of their status. He says, hey, whether you're positionally above me, whether you're positionally below me, whether you work alongside of me, I want to encourage you. I want to help you. I want to uh, admonish you. I want to be patient with you. Whatever the situation, we should act in a way that's consistent with love. And then he moves on and says something fairly controversial. So he moves on from uh, how we should treat people who are hurting to how we should treat people who are hurting people. And this is where things are going to get a little bit different. He says, hey, help the weak, help those who are hurt, help them. But he moves from people who are hurting to people who hurt other people. This is what he says. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone, rejoice always. Always seek to do good to one another and rejoice always. He starts out that phrase by saying, see that. Everyone say, see that. This section over here, see that. You guys right over here, see that. See that is a command. See that? No, see, see that is a command that he uses to give instruction. So he says, see that you don't repay evil for evil. My command for you when someone does wrong for you, my command for you when someone uh, hurts you, my command for you uh, when you have been wrong, when you have been lied about, when you have been bullied, when you have been hurt, my command for you is not to repay evil for evil. Now, that's completely different than than the way we live. That's completely different than uh, the society we live in. And he follows it with another command. He said, and on top of that, don't just not do bad things to those who do bad things to you. He says, actually, take it a step further and do good things to those people. How many of you have ever felt strong urgings to do good things to the people who hurt you? How many people have ever felt, raise, raise a hand right now. Think of someone who lied about you. Think of someone who hurt you. Do you just, are you just welling up with feelings of generosity, welling up with feelings of, of good tidings? Probably not. Yet, what Paul's saying right here, don't repay evil for evil and seek to do good to those people. And the question that I want to answer today is why? Why does he say to do that? Why is it in our benefit that we don't repay evil to evil, we don't get revenge, we don't get back at people, and even on top of that, our response is to do good? So here's where we're going to be going today. The more you hold on to a grudge, the more it holds on to you. The more you hold on to a grudge, the more it holds on to you. Our unwillingness to forgive in moments of pain and hurt, our unwillingness Uh, to to deal with those things in moments of pain and hurt actually have a cost to us. You know, we can call it a grudge, and maybe for us, holding on to a grudge is just replaying those moments in our head over and over again of what they did. But this time, we say the right thing or we do the right thing that really gets them in that moment. Maybe it looks like when, we're not, when we, we become bitter and we begin to treat people differently around us. Maybe, maybe it looks like when we hold on to a grudge that, that we start excluding other people before people have a chance to exclude us. And here's, here's what we have to be careful about because what happens when we let bitterness sit in, what happens when we let these grudges take hold of us is they become cycles. And if we are not careful what's happened to us, will happen through us to other people. I want, I want you to hear that again. Everyone looking right here. What will, happens to us if we are not careful with resentment and bitterness will happen through us to other people if we are not careful. So we, we need to do something about it. It has the ability to affect the relationships that we form. It has the ability to make us distrust the people around us. It has the uh, ability to ruin strong friendships and change our lives forever. So listen to me, 
Students, unforgiveness has a cost. Unforgiveness has a cost. And rarely does unforgiveness cost the offender, the one who has wronged you, more than it costs you. Rarely does unforgiveness cost the person who has harmed you, the person who has done something to you, the person uh, who has hurt you in some way. Rarely does it cost them more than it costs you because as we begin to let that bitterness sink in, as we begin to let those thoughts and those feelings sink in and change how we act and change how we operate and change how we treat people, like I said, students, what happens to us will happen through us to other people, people we care about, people who we want good relationships with simply because we didn't watch out for this. Unforgiveness has a cost and it begin, can begin to control you. And not only does unforgiveness have a cost, but forgiveness has a cost as well. Forgiveness has a cost as well. Here's how we're gonna define forgiveness. Forgiveness is a conscious decision to let go of someone's debt to us and not expect them to pay it back. To let go of someone's debt to us and not expect them to pay it back. Forgiveness has a cost. And I know that sounds super great and super spiritual and even sounds like something that we should do. It even sounds like something Jesus would do. But if I'm being honest, and if you're being honest in this room, it doesn't feel like something we really want to do naturally, that we would operate that way, that we would do what what Paul said, not repay evil for evil, but seek to do good instead. Because there's a cost. There's a cost. There's a cost when someone chooses forgiveness, they are allowing themselves to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually wounded, knowing that the other person does not have the same cost, that the offending party does not have equal measure. But here's what forgiveness doesn't mean. I want you to lean in because I feel like we can, especially in the church, we can uh, get very confused. And not only can we cheapen forgiveness, but we can do it wrong. Uh, Forgiveness doesn't mean that you haven't really been hurt. Forgiveness doesn't mean that the pain that you've experienced, the hurt that you've experienced isn't real. Forgiveness doesn't mean that other people shouldn't face consequences to their actions. Forgiveness doesn't mean uh, the reason that you do it is for someone else's benefit. Forgiveness doesn't mean you can't set boundaries. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to stay quiet about this. And I want to I spend some time here real quick because the reality is, is that there are probably people in this room who have been hurt. Uh, who have been mistreated, who have uh, been abused. And what the Bible is not telling you in this moment is to just sit in that with this ethereal pixie dust of forgiveness. It does tell us to forgive, but it doesn't tell us that we should sit under abusive situations, that we should sit under hurtful situations, that we should just sit in it and take it like we're some type of floor mat. It has a cost, but we shouldn't do that. And and this is actually my encouragement to you. I want you to, to take this moment. This is my encouragement to you. If you are someone who would say you're in a situation like that, not only do I encourage you to say something about it, but find someone that you trust, that cares about you, and say something to them about it soon. Say something to them about it soon. So unforgiveness has a cost, and forgiveness has a cost. So, so here is the question that faces us. Which one is going to cost us more? Unforgiveness is going to cost us something. Forgiveness is going to cost us something. Which one is going to cost us more? And this is where as we begin to read Paul's writings, that he is going to teach us something that is fundamentally different than anything else that you don't get in any other uh, religious system, that the world doesn't teach you, that the governments don't operate in. And this is what it is. The currency in God's economy is grace. The currency in God's economy is grace. Unforgiveness has a cost. Forgiveness has a cost. And there are some things that you can pay in your power. 
But when it comes to the forgiveness that God is talking about here, the forgiveness that allows you not to repay evil for evil, the forgiveness that allows you to seek good to those who have hurt you, who have broken your trust, who has lied to you, it requires a bank account much bigger than anything that you have access to. The currency in God's economy is grace. Here, here's how Paul's gonna talk about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. If you have your Bibles, please read this with me. I want you to see this. I say this not as a command, but to prove to you by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Jesus was rich in grace, Yet for your sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, you might become rich. And the terminology it is using here, this phrase rich in grace is literally uh, means overflowing. So the best picture I could paint you is you waking up in the morning and you are just so hungry and you are pouring that bowl of cereal but you are only pouring it to the point that when you carry it from wherever you're fixing it, that it doesn't spill over the side because no one wants that. No one wants their cereal to fall on the floor and spill out on the side. And what he's saying here by rich in grace is that it's spilling everywhere. There's just too much grace. It is going all over the place. That's the kind of grace that he is operating in. And what he's saying here, he's saying he was rich in grace, but he became poor in grace so that we could be rich in grace. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have access to the spiritual bank account that God operates in. And the currency is grace. We now have, I'm not, you guys don't spend a lot of money, so maybe all these analogies are completely useless on you. There's things that cost lots of money. Cars cost lots of money. Maybe some of you have started looking at cars. Houses cost lots of money. Hospital bills cost lots of money. But those are all things that you can pay in your own power and in your own pockets. What God is asking us to do in these moments of forgiveness, what he is asking us to do in these these moments of not repaying back evil for evil and seeking to do good for those who have wronged us requires a different bank account. He is saying he has given us access to it and we can write checks that will never bounce. We can spend money that will never go empty. The reason I think we don't do it is because the cost is just too high, right? The, the cost of actually forgiving someone, the cost of living this way Jesus is calling us to, it's just, it's just too high. It is just too hard because of what they did, because of what they said, because of what they did to me. I can't operate like that. Now, I want you, all of those things are real, but that doesn't make them necessarily true. I want you to hear this, students. Because of Jesus, the bank account of grace will never run empty. Because of Jesus, the bank account of grace will never run empty. Here's what I wanna say to you. There is nothing that you can do that God does not have enough grace to pay for on the cross of Jesus. And even the accumulation of everyone's worst thing they could ever do in this room doesn't even drain his bank account of grace in the slightest. That's how much he has. And he says he has now given it to us to spend however we want to. That we would just be able to spend grace and spend grace and spend grace and spend grace to those around us that we would live and look like Jesus. Here's the thing about forgiveness. Great acts of forgiveness astound us, right? Great acts of forgiveness astound us. When we watch a movie or we see something in the news of someone who has wronged someone, like there are literal cases of people who have 
uh, killed other people's family. And when it comes to the time where they're uh, receiving their punishment, they're in a courtroom, the family shows up. And in that moment, the family's response is to tell them, I forgive you. I want you to think about someone comes in your house, someone kills someone in your family, and these people's response in that moment is, I forgive you. And this isn't like cheerio, pat on the back, I forgive you. This is tears rolling down their cheeks, I forgive you. This is like, there is so much pain in my heart. I can barely say the words, but if I can, the words are, I forgive you. There's something about that that stands so in contrast to everything else we see and know that it just sticks out. It it astounds us. We are asking the question, how could that be? How could they get to a place where that is real for them, where they can operate like that? And here is the reality. I don't want you to miss this. That is exactly where we find ourselves with God. Man, and we, we live in a culture that knows about Christianity and we live in a culture that talks about Jesus. I feel like we miss how great grace is and how much we have been forgiven for. What's more amazing than any story of any family member that was able to forgive someone is the God who never did anything wrong that sent his son to die so that we could be forgiven. And not only that he would forgive us, but he also paid the bill. He also took the sentence that we deserved. He said, not only am I not gonna repay evil for evil, but I'm going to do good to you. When we wanna see an example for what that looks like, we look at Jesus and we look at the cross. And it is in that moment, at your worst, the worst thing that you ever think you could do or have ever done, where God looks at you And not just like an ethereal you, like just everyone in the universe all at the same time, but you specifically, and I believe it's very similar. I believe it's with tear-soaked cheeks. He says, I forgive you and I send my son Jesus. And I believe it's with pain in his heart that he says, I forgive you and I send my son Jesus. And I believe we, we cheapen that so much And we take so much for granted the grace that we've been given and the forgiveness that we have been given. And the reason I know that is because when we realize that, we can be rich in grace with the other people around us. We can give generously in grace from God's bank account. And that's when things start changing and life starts changing and people start changing but it doesn't start until you start changing. So here's my question for you. Who is the person in your life that you need to be generous in grace with? Who is the person in your life that you are holding on to a grudge? And maybe that grudge is holding on to you a little bit more and it's robbing you of joy and it's robbing you of peace and it's robbing you of being generous in grace like God is commanding for you. Pray with me.